have archaeologists discovered Sodom and Gomorrah? What are the sulfur balls that some are claiming may be the means God used to destroy the cities? Well, my guest today, Joel Kramer, has been on the show a couple times before. He's an archaeologist who lives in Jordan and has visited the very sites that we're going to talk about today. He's published some books. Joel, thanks for coming back on to talk about what I consider one of the more interesting conversations, kind of at least in the translation of archaeology to the biblical text, the potential find of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, let's jump right in. Before we look at the evidence, uh, just remind viewers what happened at Sodom and Gomorrah according to the biblical text. Uh, yeah, sure. In, uh, in Genesis chapter 19, we have the destruction of what are called the cities of the plain. And, uh, and so it says specifically that the Lord rained down burning sulfur mm. from the Lord from heaven. And, uh, and so we have this burning of these cities, and then uh, these cities are abandoned after that and become examples even up into the time of the early church, the time of Jesus and the early church are used as an examples of uh, God's judgment and, uh, and desolation. Mm. Now, in some ways you started to answer this, but I was going to ask specifically, why do we care if the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are potentially or actually found? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And um, in this particular case, uh, we read the story of Lot, who is in Sodom and is trying to reason with uh, his uh, sons-in-law, you know, get out of this place, it's going to be uh, destroyed, and they think he's joking. And, and so we have this intense story, and, and, uh, and really the situation is, is that we are in the world today in the same situation that the people in Sodom and Gomorrah were in in their day. Um, Jesus clearly says this um, when he talks about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah as a, an example of exactly how it's going to be when the Son of Man returns, when he mm. returns. And so, um, and so to understand how those who did survive, Lot and his daughters, this massive destruction is really key to understanding how you survive the end of the world. That's a powerful thing to say. So not only finding these cities could be one support for the reliability of the Bible or not finding them or evidence against them could undermine the Bible. But this is a particular story about God's judgment of evil, which has a lot to say to our moment today as well. It's interesting on those two levels. Now, the Bible talks about where Sodom and Gomorrah may be found. It doesn't give us an exact like latitude, but it gives us kind of boundaries what biblical boundaries does the Bible give us of where we should expect to find these cities? Yeah, the probably the most uh, key verse, or, or one of the most basic ones, is Genesis 14, where we have the five cities of the plains named. Those are Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Zoar. And then it mentions the kings from those five cities and names them. And then they are defending themselves against a, an attack from a, an army. And so they're fighting in defense of their cities, it says, in the Valley of Sidim, which is the hmm. Salt Sea. So this is a reference to the Dead Sea. So we would expect the cities of the plain to be near the Dead Sea. And then uh, another key verse is uh, Genesis 10:19, which is laying out the boundaries for Canaan. And it gives the western boundary along the Mediterranean coast from Sidon in the north down to Gaza in the south. And then it says uh, you turn towards and it names out Sodom and Gomorrah and the rest of the cities okay. of the plain. That could only be east because you've come from the north. You've stopped. You've been told to stop at Gaza. You can either turn to the west or to the east. If you turn to the west, you go out into the Mediterranean Sea. Right. So the only way that it can you can turn is east. So that means that um, these five cities of the plain and their towns, this agricultural plain, is uh, east of Gaza. And then Ezekiel 16.46 says that uh, Samaria, or, uh, Samaria is to the north of Jerusalem and your wicked sister uh, uh, Sodom is to the south of Jerusalem. Mm. And so those are the three keys right there. 
Um, the Cities of the Plain, which by the way, is it, we're looking for something huge, not, not small. Um, we're, we're not even looking for one city. We're looking for five cities, that are, five main mm. cities and their towns in an agricultural plain um, that is south of Jerusalem, near the Dead Sea and east of Gaza. Should be easy to find. Yeah, right, right. Now, if we take those three markers that you mentioned, roughly how much area are we talking about in that southern part of Israel? Um, well, it's the southern part of, of Jordan today. And it's, uh, it's roughly, you know, um, you're talking about 25, 30 miles across it from north to south. Okay, so none of these sites are in modern-day Israel. They're all in present-day All of Jordan. them are on, yes, okay. on the southeast side of the Dead Sea. So roughly an area 25, 30 miles across. We're looking for five cities with certain signature marks that match the story in Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. Yeah, and now, I should I should I should mention really quickly too that um one of the one of the reasons today when you're driving on the southeast side of the Jordan uh, or the, the Dead Sea in Jordan and you're driving south through this area you you're, you're in an area that only receives less than two inches of rain per year it's a desert area and all of a sudden you come into this green agricultural mm. area it's bizarre. And so how is that possible? Well, it's because the um, plateau, the, the high mountains of Jordan receive a lot of rain. And so the springs are coming out uh, from, from this rain that falls in the high country is draining down and coming out in this particular okay. area. So it's a very important agricultural area, even to this day. And the reason why is because you have this warm desert-like climate and you have lots of water and so you can grow your agriculture year round in this area. Okay, so I'm eager to get to the evidence, but just bear with me to make sure I understand the three markers that you gave near the Dead Sea, and of course, east of uh, Gaza, south of Jerusalem, there are areas in southern Israel that could, in principle, fit that. So why don't we look in Israel? Why only in Jordan? Absolutely. Um, you know, the southwest portion of the Dead Sea matches that biblical location just like the southeast does. The reason that um, that we don't have uh, sites identified as Sodom and Gomorrah on the western side, the Israel side, is because no archaeological sites have been found over there. And okay. again, the reason the reason has to do with water. Um, on, on the southeast side, you have these high mountains in Jordan where mm -hmm. you get an abundance of water coming down in like a drain down to the Dead Sea. On the Israel side, you're, you're in, uh, above that is the Negev Desert that doesn't receive a lot of uh, rain. And so you don't have the water on the western side. And so you don't, there's no uh, archeological sites. It's not that there's archeological sites that don't match. There's just no archeological sites. Okay. On the southwest side of, uh, of th that are from this time period. Yeah. That makes sense. Now we're going to get into some of the specifics of these archaeological sites, but maybe just frame it for us that if these events happen as described in the Bible 4,000 years ago, what could or would we expect to find in the cities of the plains? Like, what are we looking for in that region that would tell us, oh, we've potentially found Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah, well, when you're digging in a, a tell, an ancient mound, which is several cities stacked on top of each other, the, the, layer, the layers that stand out the most are the burn destruction layers. Ash and the destruction, uh, the burn layer. In this case, we're not looking for just a destruction layer in uh, a city. We're looking for multiple cities that have been burned Okay. and uh, to ash. So um, we're not actually looking for these big glorious tells um, because a tell is, is uh, it rises over time. It forms over time because one city uh, is destroyed or becomes ruins and then another city is built on top and another city and another city. And then over a long period, thousands of years of occupation, you get these really impressive looking tells. That's yeah. not what we're looking for because... Okay. Um, the cities of the plain are described as being burned and then never being rebuilt, uninhabited. Gotcha. And we know this. We we know this because the um, several of the prophets 
um, use Sodom and Gomorrah um, and other cities as examples of this destruction and desolation. So, for example, Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah says, if the Lord hadn't delivered us from the Assyrians, we would have become like Sodom and Gomorrah. We would be extinct. Um, we have Jeremiah and Isaiah in Isaiah 13 saying that uh, Babylon uh, also is, uh, is going to become like Sodom and Gomorrah. We have Jesus in Capernaum, his, the headquarters of his ministry, and he's telling uh, Capernaum, you're going to become like Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. therefore, uh, therefore, these cities of the plain can't be Roman cities. Otherwise, it wouldn't be used as an example by Jesus and Peter and others okay. as an example, and, and they wouldn't be used. They can't be um, cities in the um, kingdom of Israel, period. Otherwise, the prophets wouldn't use them as examples of utter desolation. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for sites that have been destroyed by fire and, and forever abandoned. That's really helpful. When you took uh, me and our team of students to Jericho, and there's different layers. There's a tell, like city, like you describe it, like a cake, layer on top of layer. And people do this because there's protection and there's a strong foundation. There may be water. There's reasons for that. And when you get to the layer of Jericho, you show that they find burn remains uh, around the time that the Bible describes the conquest. That's a completely different burning remains than this, which is total destruction. City never occupied again. So that makes a lot of sense in terms of what we would look for, archaeologically speaking. Now, is this evidence we're going to get into new with you? Are you making some novel claim about Sodom and Gomorrah? Have archaeologists been examining these sites for a while? Give us some context about that, if you will. Yeah, none, none of the things that we're talking about are my idea or a new idea or anything okay. like that. These are, these are the established sites for Sodom and Gomorrah and the um, cities of the plain. The new claims that have come out, you know, in recent times are what has thrown confusion on what was already understood in the past. And so um, it, it did take a, a longer period of time for these sites to be discovered. The first uh, site, Bab -e Dra, was discovered uh, in 1924. So when you're looking at other biblical cities, sites that were uh, discovered, um, many of them were long before that. So why did it take so long? for the first of these sites to be discovered? Well, two reasons. One, the area that they um, are in, in, in the southeast side of the Dead Sea, it was an extremely remote mm. area, and people didn't go into that area. And so uh, the most famous biblical archaeologist of all time, William Foxwell Albright, mm. is the one that went in in 1924, and he was the first archaeologist to go in there. Wow. Now, why did he go into that particular area? Because uh, Albright knew his Bible, and he knew where to go looking for the cities of the plain, according to his Bible. And so um, on that expedition, he found uh, the site of Babidra and, um, and dated it to uh, 2000 B.C., roughly the time of Abraham and Lot. And, uh, and so... Um, that started things off, but uh, that site then was excavated in the early 60s by one of his students named Paul Lapp. Mm. Okay, that makes sense. Now, when you say, like, the consensus view, is this among biblical scholars? And I ask because I would guess that the vast majority of scholars with a more secular or a different worldview think this entire story is fictional anyways, and it's a myth, right? Yes. Um, well, actually, yes, that is correct, uh, especially today. That wasn't so much the case uh, back in 1924 and back when okay. these uh, were being excavated in the 60s. Basically, I would say that, um, that the consensus, at least back then, because, you know, I mean, the ones who dug the sites really from, from what they've written were pretty secular themselves. Oh. Um, what they what they believed is that the Bible, and this many scholars believe this, that the Bible was uh, written later in history than what uh, we as Christians believe, and um, and so uh, they basically took the position that um, that these these cities were destroyed, and this is what the biblical writers later in history were referring to. These cities and this okay. destruction, 
Got but it. they were making up a story that was uh, mm. that was mythological. But they were that story was based on real events that happened to real cities, and and these were the cities that that had happened to. Okay, gotcha. That helps. That worldview difference really clarifies. Now we're going to jump into some of these cities that you've mentioned, and we have some pictures that so people can actually see this. You have gone on site and made this documentary on your website. I have a link below. Not only your website on your YouTube channel, which I hope our uh, viewers will subscribe to top quality, fascinating on-site archaeological digs. But I texted very quickly. I texted my assistant. I said, "Hey, I'm sending you six images of Sodom and Gomorrah." Sent it and didn't read it. And I looked at it. And said, "Oh, I'm sending you sex images of Sodom and Gomorrah," <laughs> and thought that's kind of ironic on a couple levels. So if you are yeah. looking for those images, that will not be on this video. <laughs> But we do want to have some images for you. That is uh, so in the Bible, can... though. <laughs> yeah, it is in the Bible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm glad you yeah, chuckled think... on that one. And I that take it... groups, you know. I take groups to these sites, and I'm telling them the story of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot's Cave and all that stuff, and I'm realizing, oh, my gosh, there's there's kids here. <laughs> what, what, can I, what can I say and what can I say? <laughs> Good. So, yeah. Exactly. Let's jump into the actual images of the site but let's start with a city called Baba Dra. Uh, what do we find and does it match up with the biblical account? Yeah so um, Albright found Baba Dra in 1924 of the five um, early bronze archaeological sites found in this area it is the largest and um, and so his student Paul Lapp uh, um, was took over for Albright in Jerusalem and he noticed that all these intact uh, pots from the early bronze period were coming into the antiquity market in Jerusalem and he was thinking what on earth mm. where are all these things coming from and so he actually followed the trail and figured out they were coming from Babi Dra and mm. not from the city ruins themselves but from the cemetery that's right next to him and so the cemetery is is just really impressive um, you can tell where it is today in my video I show uh, aerial footage of it because of the locals coming in for you know decades and decades and and digging into these graves to try to find antiquities you have these pot marks all over the place wow. um through throughout here and so paul lapp came in and started excavating the cemetery and uh and found that the burn destruction later after he was digging the cemetery he went over and started digging the city and he's the one that determined this is a city a walled city okay and um and so the burn destruction over the cemetery, there's a burn destruction over the cemetery, that's kind of weird, hmm. is at the same time uh, that the city is burned. So the two were destroyed at the same time. And so he really puzzled over this. Um, you know, I, I don't see why he really, pu he had the Bible <laughs> explaining it, but, um, but anyways, you know, why would uh, an army destroy a cemetery? Well, they wouldn't. And, um, and this cemetery is huge. Um, it's estimated that 500,000, a half a million people are buried in this cemetery. Wow. And, uh, and the, the graves that are up at the top, because just like a city is in different layers, so are cemeteries. And the type of uh, tombs that they used at that time were these mud adobe-like houses that they put the dead in. And these mm -hmm. were burned through in their roofs, and then the contents inside were burned. And so... Uh, and it all happened at once. You know, if it was cremation or something like that, it would have happened over a long period of time. And so, um, and so, and then, and then the date of of the pottery that was coming from the cemetery's destruction okay. matched the date of the um, destruction in the city. And so okay. that was the first thing that was lined up, and um, and that was really what had Paul Lapp convinced. This is you know this is definitely one of the cities of the plane we're in the cities of the plane what about the warped bones that were found yeah the um the bones that he pulled uh out of those uh tombs and studied and had them studied he has pictures of those in the excavation report and uh and they're actually warped from the heat that um that these carnal houses or charnel houses as they're called received um when they were met their fire destruction and so the the remains of the people inside had 
um, suffered severe heat and burning. And uh, it's really amazing evidence. I've never seen anything like it. Again, you see destructions in, in cities, but this one covers the entire city and then covers uh, the cemetery as well. And so so he, he concluded because of that evidence that this was a natural disaster. Oh, interesting. Okay, we'll get to that, what kind of natural disaster it could be. But basically, if yeah. you start with the Bible, a certain location, a certain time, a certain kind of city destroyed in a particular fashion by fire, that's what the archaeological record seems to show when we look at Babadra. What about Numera? Okay, so um, Paul Lapp, unfortunately, um, died very young. He took a swim in Cyprus and drowned in wow. 1970. And so uh, two of his students named Rast and Schwab took over the excavations at Baba Draw. And in 1973, they did a survey of the whole area. They wanted to know what else was around there. And so they identified um, three more uh, early bronze sites, uh, Numera and uh, Fifa and Kanazir. The other site that we'll talk about, Safi, was already known at that okay. point. So now there's five cities of the plain in the Bible. And now we have five early bronze time, um, according to the biblical chronology, five okay. um, archaeological sites um, that are in this area. And so they they excavated Numera, which uh, many linguists connect the name Numera to Gomorrah. And it's kind of complicated hmm. and I'm no linguist, but um, there is a, a uh, linguistic connection there, which is why that site was the one that was connected to Gomorrah. Got it. And uh, and so then um, they excavated that city. They found the same thing. It had been severely destroyed by fire. And, and they say in their excavation report, and never, ever, wow. ever lived in again. And wow. one thing that I should point out is, again, how important this agricultural area is and that you have a water source in both of these sites to mm. this day. Still, you have, wow. Yes, you have flowing streams right past mm. both of these sites. And yet, um, when they were destroyed some 4,000 years ago, they've never been rebuilt. They've never been, in the case of Numera, ever inhabited ever again. And so, um, so then they connected these, uh, these destructions between these two sites and uh and and later you know we can talk about carbon 14 later but um okay but yeah okay we'll get into some of that dating let's look at two more of the cities and then we'll start talking about these sulfur balls and this super interesting discussion but tell us about fifa and conazir so yeah the the survey um also uh revealed these other two sites and not just those two sites but also some of the towns early bronze towns that the Bible mentions uh, in regards to these five cities. And so, um, so those were discovered in the, um, in the survey. Uh, they haven't been uh, excavated. Uh, so, some of their cemeteries, they have cemeteries as well, and there's been some work done in the cemeteries, but not in the town themselves. Uh, but, you know, you go to the site and it's like identical to the other two that have been excavated. Um, the, you know, in most sites, you have to dig way down into a tell to get to the destruction layer. Right. But because these are basically, I call these cities stunted tells. Hmm. These are tells that would have grown and developed over time, but their growth got stunted by this fire. And so their final phase is a burn destruction layer. And so literally all you have over the top of that is, um, you know, some of the dust that's been blown over it for years, but you can kick the ground and ash comes up and you're already in that destruction. So to get to this early bronze period in most tells, you'd have to dig and dig and dig for years and years and years all the way down until right. you finally reach this time period. Whereas this, these sites, you, uh, you immediately dig straight into the destruction layer that is the top layer. And so Case. even though they haven't been excavated, it's mm. still easy to determine that they were destroyed by fire. Okay, so what we know right now with the archaeology is that to the time and to the place, we find the kinds of cities that the Bible would expect destroyed in the way Genesis reports that they were destroyed. 
But what about Zoar? Is there any evidence this was destroyed in catastrophe? Because I think the Bible says this city survived. Yeah, so the, the biblical account, um, Lot and his uh, wife and daughters are in Sodom. And, uh, and so he's told to flee to, uh, to the mountains. And, um, and, and Lot is an old man. And the mountains, like I had said, are very, very high. That's where all this water is coming from. And uh, Lot's like, I'm too old. I, I, I'll die. I can't, <laughs> right, right. I can't climb out of this valley. Um, how about this, this city, which the name of the city is Bella? Um, and uh, okay. how about, it's a small one. It's a small city. You know, would you spare this small city if I run to, uh, to it? And so Zoar in Hebrew means small. And so the Lord says, okay, you can, you can run to mm. this city, Zoar, and I will spare it um, because of you. And so, of course, uh, Lot's wife turns into a pillar of salt, but uh, he and his two daughters end up in Zoar. And Zoar is the one of the five cities that is spared. And therefore, what we're looking for archaeologically is even, even more detail. We're looking for five major early bronze cities, four of them destroyed by fire, and one of them not destroyed by fire. That survives history. And that's exactly what we find here. Zoar is the one that's mentioned in the extra biblical sources um, because it's the only one that survives history. And uh, so, for example, uh, the oldest map of the Holy Land that we have is here in Jordan. It's called the Madaba map. It's on the church floor. It's from 86th century. And uh, the only cities of the plain that's on that map is Zoar. Why? Because it still exists. And it's shown, as, it's shown as a city, as a Byzantine city on the map. And then also a church over uh, the cave where Lot and his daughters lived. And both of those have been found and excavated by a Greek archaeologist named Politus, and uh, they've they've been identified and found. And so, um, and then we have references to them from Eusebius, for example, okay. talks about them on the map. Uh, the city's name is Zura, so you, that preserves the biblical name Zoar. But hmm. if that's not good enough for people, Eusebius says that Zora is the biblical city of Zoar, and he says the oh. only city to have escaped uh, the catastrophe. And so, um, and, and then the interesting thing, the really interesting thing to me is, okay, so you have this whole area of the plains. And uh, so I would expect maybe Zoar to be out on the outskirts. You know, all the rest of it is destroyed. And then Zoar is out right on the edge of that destruction and doesn't get destroyed. But that's not the case. Um, Zoar is right in the middle of the other four. So there's two to mm. the north of Zoar and two more of the destroyed cities to the south of Zo Zoar wow. covered in this ash. There are cemeteries covered in ash. And right smack dab in the middle is Zoar, who also has a huge cemetery next to it. But the difference between the cemetery of Zoar and the cemetery of these other four sites is that the cemeteries go out of use at the destruction of the cities of these other four cities. But the cemetery of Zoar continues in use. People continue to be buried there in uh, the Middle Bronze and in the Iron Age and all the way into the Roman period and in, into the wow. Byzantine period with gravestones wow. that say Zora, you know, Zoar <laughs> on them. And so. Wow. Yeah, it's it's quite obvious. That, that that's incredible. That I, I I this is an area I've not studied in depth until you started sending me some of this material. And I just want to make sure this is the interpretation of this might be debated, but the fact that we found five cities, four destroyed, one not with the name Zora in the place to the time that the story in Genesis uh, calculates and says that finding in itself is really not debated right now amongst scholars. Is that fair? Yeah. In fact, I would say that, um, that the evidence is so strong that they adopted this uh, secular interpretation that, okay, this story in the Bible has to, um, has to be based on something that really happened um, to, to some catastrophe that happened in the past. And this must be it because because of the way that it fits the biblical record with the evidence. 
Okay, interesting. Now, you mentioned earlier that, that you think it maybe was a natural disaster that caused this. And it's important for people to understand that sometimes when God does a miracle, like splitting the, the Red Sea, he sends an east wind and does it through natural means. But it's the power and the location and the timing that arguably makes it identifiable as miraculous. How do you think this was destroyed? And are there any potential remains of this kind of destruction? Yeah, so... Um... You know, what I would say is, is the, the way me and you might think of how this was destroyed is one thing. But what's really funny is when you're looking at the uh, the excavation team themselves who have geologists, um, Clapp and Donahue are the geologists that work on this site. And, you know, what you have here is a crime scene. It's like a crime scene. You have you have four cities destroyed and their cemeteries destroyed by fire. Hmm. What on earth happened? You know, so so even though they're coming from more of a secular standpoint, they have to give a reason. They have to give an explanation for what happened. Yep. And so what they say is uh, they say that this lies along the um, a major fault line. You know, the Rift Valley is the lowest place on Earth and it, it's a major fault line. And so they say there must have been an earthquake. Uh, which then caused these gases and whatnot oh. to come up from the ground. And, uh, and basically, they say the area exploded. And, mm. um, and so I've talked to, um, to the geologists that, that, um, that I know, and they, they seem to think that that's a very reasonable explanation for mm. how this physical sulfur, because you have the evidence of sulfur balls in this area now honestly uh the sulfur balls it took me a long time to understand these sulfur balls um you know i i went down and there's a museum this this uh archaeologist that excavated zoar um has a museum down in that area and on in on the in the display in that museum are these sulfur balls hmm. and so i was fascinated with them there they are it's his explanation of what destroyed these cities and of course that matches a biblical account which says burning sulfur came down out of heaven and destroyed these cities and so i went to these sites and i scoured these sites and i looked and i looked and looked for a sulfur ball and i couldn't find a sulfur ball to save my life <laughs> and uh so finally one day i was uh i was guiding a geologist named john whitmore around um Jordan and uh, and so I took him to that museum and I showed him the display and I said I can't find any sulfur balls I was I was a sulfur ball skeptic <laughs> <laughs> and he said uh, he said oh well you're looking in the wrong place hmm. they wouldn't you wouldn't find them on land you uh, you would find them only uh, where the Dead Sea waters have receded and the reason why is because they're they're coming down from uh, on fire and so they would burn up and they would burn anything that they hit. But if they hit the water, that would, um, they would go out and, uh, and sink down to the bottom and whatnot. So then uh, there was another geologist friend of mine that was in town a little bit after that. And so we went down looking for sulfur balls. And sure enough, uh, we found some. And then I went back uh, again and found more and more. And then they're just, you know, they're, they're all over the place, down where the water has receded. Now, you know, in the video that I did, I burn those and show um, show how they burn and how they turn to goo when they when they burn. And I've taken them, I've burned them, I've dropped them in water. I've seen what happens when they hit water and then they sink down to the bottom. And that's what the, that's the way you find them in these areas, as I show in the video, is you have the geological uh, layers and um and you have them in a layer you know these uh these sulfur balls yeah and then they're eroding out and washing down the ravines and uh and so now now one of the geologists uh have have, have been doing a lot of research and uh on these and everything and um he's you know he's looked at all that's been written on this kind of stuff and he's pretty much determined uh at least at this point, unless there's something that he doesn't know about or we don't know about, that that this 
sulfur balls these sulfur balls like these are unique to the southern end of the dead sea mm. and so um and so that's really interesting but um but yeah so um so it's not me connecting the sulfur balls to the okay. destruction it's actually the archaeologists that have excavated down there that's what they have displayed in the um, museum down there that they're connecting to the destruction of these sites and uh and you know it makes perfect sense to me when you read the biblical description of how these mm. cities were destroyed that they were destroyed by burning sulfur and then you have this unique so so i can't as an archaeologist i can't tell you how unique these archaeological sites okay are. I mean, okay i've lived in the middle east for 28 years I've never seen anything like these sites, a, wow. an area that vast that has been destroyed like that. It's so unique and there has to be an explanation for it. And, and then you have this unique geological, uh, you know, phenomenon that's unique to this particular part of the world, the Southern mm -hmm. end of the Dead Sea. And it just seems, and then you have the biblical connection that these cities were destroyed by burning sulfur coming down from heaven. It's just, uh, you know, <laughs> It's just too uh, strong of a connection to to ignore. I mean, it uh, it's what makes sense to me. Now, okay. how exactly how exactly sulfur ends up spraying up in the air, you know, from uh, earthquake and all that kind of stuff, uh, I I don't really know. Um, hmm. Or how God worked that, like you said, how much of it was natural and how much of it, you know was him you know that that's there's lots of questions there yeah good well i i can envision the scene where you go to the museum see these sulfur balls and are like i'm gonna go find them at the dead sea disappointed that you don't this geologist tells you out of the look in the water or the rains where there was water then you go find them and you visualize this within your uh documentary this must have been one of the coolest moments for you. Did like the Indiana Jones theme song start playing <laughs> naturally in the background? Was that honestly one of the cool moments for you as an archaeologist? Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm. You know, I mean, uh, I, I, I have been taking groups to these sites and teaching them for several years. I've been studying them for several years and and it's just like any site over here. You don't just show up at a site and look at it for uh, an hour or two, and then you got to figure it mm. out, and then you leave. It takes it takes years and years. It's it's mm. one of the benefits of living over here. So you can go and look, and you get confused by something, and you come back and you think about it. That doesn't make any sense, and then you oh well maybe it's you know, and then you go check it out, and okay. uh, back and forth, back and forth, and um, and so it it all has to make sense to me. I have to work it all out in my own understanding in order to then be able to explain it to uh, somebody else and teach it to a group and sense. teach it to seminary students and whatnot. And so, um, and so it's been, it's been years and years that I've been studying Jericho, as you know, mm -hmm. and uh, same thing with these sites. These are kind of like, I lived in Israel for 10 years studying Jericho that whole time and over here now this these sites have been kind of my jericho on this side mm. of the jordan river and um and you know it's it's uh the evidence is so amazing that it's not it's obvious it, all the connection with the biblical record is very obvious but it it uh it takes time to figure out and there's still lots of questions mm. you uncover one question and you answer it and it leads to a hundred more unanswered questions and so it's, it's a continual thing mm -hmm. like that yeah. well there's a lot of questions about the dating that we're going to get into but before we specifically that lay that out are there other sites and theories about sodom and gomorrah that are competing for this in particular on a more popular level like youtube i see all these other videos popping up i don't know what to make sense of them they're not my expertise but are there some other theories and what do you make of them yeah I would say uh, probably the most there, there's there's two other places that um, okay that are identified. One is the western southwestern side of the Dead Sea, um, and the other one is uh, up on the northern end of the Dead Sea, especially at a site called Tel El Hamam. Hmm. And so um, on the western side, it's this uh, you know there's sulfur balls over there, and so you see videos of people burning sulfur balls, 
Okay. And, and they're pointing they're pointing to uh, geological formations and trying to convince people that those are archaeological sites. They're not. And uh, mm. and then it's talking it's looking at marl, which is is like a chalk. It's a sedimentary rock that was formed when uh, at the bottom of the Dead Sea. And they're saying this is burned ash, which of course it's not. And, um, okay. and so. There's a bunch of things like that. Believe me, if there were archaeological sites on the southwest side of the Dead Sea, they would have been excavated a long time ago. Um, just like these sites were excavated right when, okay. you know, I mean, because they would have been candidates for Sodom and Gomorrah and they would have been dug. Really, Albright went into this area looking for these sites, real frustrated because they hadn't been found yet, even mm. up till 1924. So anyways, again, the, the problem with the southwest side isn't location. It is uh, that there aren't archaeological sites. And so you'll see okay. all these videos trying to make something that's not archaeological into something archaeological. And it, it, it doesn't work. Uh, the other one is the north is Tel El Hammam. And uh, the problem with Tel El Hammam are two things. One is location. Mm -hmm. It can't possibly be... Uh, it can't be uh, Sodom because uh, the Bible clearly says that Sodom is south of Jerusalem. Tel al Hamam is north of Jerusalem. It also says that it's east of Gaza. Gaza is far to the south from Jericho. Tal Hamam is opposite Jericho, which is why it's the number one candidate for uh, Abel Shatim in the Bible, because Abel Shatim is described as being east of Jericho. Um, Sodom is described as being uh, east of Gaza. You can't, you can't have the site. The, the the director there says that his site Tal Al Hamam is, is both Shatim and Sodom. That's like saying, you know, Beersheba and Jerusalem are the same city. Uh, that's okay. an impossibility. That's a contradiction. Um, can't can't possibly be. Neither of them could be it. One of them or the other, but not both. Okay. So um, so it's disqualified in its location from. From the Bible, that's that's the most important thing. Then secondary is uh, it, it, its archaeology is doesn't line up because it is a magnificent tell. It's one of the most magnificent tells in all of Jordan, um, and that's because it was occupied one period after another after another. They've excavated a late bronze building. They've they've excavated there a um, Iron Age palace from the Kingdom period of Israel time period. They've excavated, uh, it, it, it was a huge um, uh, Roman city. Uh, and so it, 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 you can't have a Roman city when Jesus is saying, okay. Capernaum, you're going to become like Sodom and Gomorrah. Then Sodom can't be a Roman city. And the prophet saying, Babylon, you, you big glorious Babylon. Which, which, by the way, I've been to Babylon. I've traveled there a couple times, mm. and I just released a video on, on Babylon nice. as well. And what a, what a bizarre experience for myself to have studied Sodom and Gomorrah so much and know what they look like, and then go to, uh, go to Babylon where Isaiah and Jeremiah say, mm. Babylon, you will become like Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, whether the Babylonians understood what they were saying, who knows? But the Israelites surely knew what they were uh, saying. And so and then when you're at Babylon today, it's like Sodom and Gomorrah. It's completely wow. uninhabited and abandoned. Wow. And so um, and so Tal, uh, Tal al Hamam does not match archaeological. Okay. And they try to put this they try to argue there's this gap of time and th that it's wide and that there was only one building at this period and that kind of thing. But um but yeah, it just it just doesn't okay. work, and uh, and so it does work for Shatim. It, it's a very important site, and their archaeological work there, in my opinion, is very important. Um, but but yeah, not for Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, not for good. Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, it, it's it's like this, it's like this with many sites. You have the old established sites, okay. where if you were. Uh, if you were in the past in the 1920s or 30s or 40s or 50s or 60s and on, and you were ask, asking to go to Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have taken you to these sites that we're talking mm. about. And then you have these new claims okay. by, uh, by um, that, oh, no, no, this is Sodom and Gomorrah, and that is what is 
confused people. And um, that is what people, har hardly anybody knows about these established, excavated, mm. burnt sites and burnt cemeteries and and uh, and the connection. Okay, if you got sulfur balls, fine, that's interesting. You got sulfur balls. But what makes those sulfur balls interesting is when they connect to the archaeological record and specifically in this case to the destruction of this archaeological record. And then both of those connect to the written text that says this is how it all connects. Then you have something powerful. OK, let's talk a little bit about the dating. I know this is controversial as well, and there's a number of issues without getting too lost in the particulars of radiocarbon. <laughs> yeah. um, so far, we've been assuming that the dating of these cities matches up with a biblical account. So maybe tell us how we can actually date this biblically and why you think we have reason outside the Bible, pottery, remains, radiocarbon, whatever it is, that these match up. Yeah, it it's the number one argument against any connection from archaeology to okay. the Bible. It always comes down to the connection is so strong, it's so obvious that the only way really to argue against it is to go like this chronologically, right? Mm. To say it doesn't line up chronologically. It, over and over, Jericho, on and on and on. So that's always the argument. The argument is always focused on chronology. Yeah, yeah, you got burned cities. Yeah, you got sulfur balls. You got all these things but the dates don't line up, okay? So um, in this case, it's not the pottery dates that don't line up. When, uh, when the site was discovered by Albright, who is the main guy who developed the pottery chronology that's still used today, he dated it uh, to within um, the time of the biblical chronology. Um, 2067 is the biblical chronology destruction for Sodom and Gomorrah. He okay. dated it to around 2000. Um, so that fit very nicely, hmm. you know, give or take, you know, as he sure. would say. And, uh, sure. and so um, and, and then uh, Paul Lapp did his excavations there. He's the one that determined this is uh, definitely a walled city and whatnot. He dated it to 2100 B.C., which is right in line with 2067 B.C. And remember, these dating issues get more and more complicated and sure. more and more vague the sure. further back you go in time. That makes sense. Okay, so, so there was no conflict with the dating in uh, the, the discovery and the excavation of these sites. When the, the current controversy of dating came into play was when they started using carbon-14 dating. Okay. Okay, now, uh, just to make it as simple as possible, carbon-14 dating is unreliable. Now, that's not just my opinion. But that's when you look at the spectrum of carbon-14 dates that are taken from all these different archaeological contexts, you have this wide spectrum of dates that are given from the carbon-14. And so um, it's something that almost all archaeologists use, but nobody, archaeologists aren't persuaded by carbon-14 dates. Okay. And, and there's a major problem with carbon-14 on, you know, there are also on the scientific side of carbon-14. I won't go into those, but there's a huge problem on the archaeological side. And that's because you do excavations as archaeologists, you also do surveys. And when you do surveys, you're walking across the surface of a site and you're picking up the pottery. And you can tell the occupation of that site just from the surface pottery. Okay. Now, why, why is that? It's because all the layers are mixed up. We like to explain all the layers individually separated from each other. But in reality, it's more complicated than that. People uh, want to put a house in and they dig down uh, and they dig down to bedrock and they put their house on the bedrock and they put a wall. And so they're always digging down just like we do today when you're building a house or a building. You dig down first to lay your foundation. They did the same thing. And so everything gets mixed up. And so you have a representation of the pottery from all these different time periods represented on the surface, which is why surveys work. And when you're in an archaeological layer, archaeologists know that you take all the pottery from there and you're going to have a spectrum of different pottery. Okay. You're going to date that pottery and the latest pottery in that, uh, in that layer is going to date that layer. Gotcha. 
Okay, so um, you can do that with pottery. You can tell the difference between, well, in this layer, we have this earlier pottery and this later pottery, and you, you have ways of saying, okay, separating out the later from the earlier pottery. And you're talking thousands of years sometimes um, between the earliest and latest pottery in a layer. Well, that's the problem with carbon-14. When, um, when you have a sample, say an olive pit, that you're gonna carbon-14 date, and you have three olive pits, how do you know which one maybe is, goes with the earlier pottery from that layer and which one goes with the later pottery from that gotcha. period? And the answer is you don't, you don't know. Hmm. And so um, that's why you get this spectrum of dates. Um, there's, there's other problems that I won't go into, okay. but, um, but and, so, and so when carbon-14 was brought in with the early bronze period, then it, they, they, they dated it later than they had, or, or earlier in time, older than they had before. Gotcha. And then it appears that it doesn't match. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it's, it's carbon-14 dating. <laughs> okay. Um, I would definitely it, put pottery dating above carbon-14 dating, and then I would put above pottery dating and all of it, uh, the the connecting to a historical text that the historical text is what is gotcha. dating your layer yeah so we have at least the pottery in favor of it we have the historical text in favor of it and then against it is radiocarbon which admittedly by the experts is helpful to a degree but not definitive for the problems that you stated so there's really no good reason to question that the dating in fact lines up based on the evidence we have right now. Is that a fair conclusion? That's, that's a fair conclusion, yeah. And okay. the hope with carbon-14 was to take the bias of the archaeology gotcha. uh, archaeologists out, out of it, but it really hasn't been able to do that, you know, yeah. Okay, so, okay, this is so, so interesting on so many levels. I have a million questions for you, but maybe tell me a little bit right now, what is some of the ongoing research? I think you mentioned that geologists are studying the sulfur balls. Is there further research on dating? What is some of the research going on right now we might expect in the next few months or years or even decades ahead? Yeah, well, the one who is doing uh, the, the work in that area and has been for quite some time is uh, Konstantinos uh, Politis, and he is a Greek archaeologist, and he's... Um, made some tremendous discoveries. He's, he's uh, excavated the church that is on the Madaba map that commemorates the cave where Lot and his daughters oh. lived. And then he excavated the cave and found early bronze material and a wall and, and in the cave that the church then commemorated as the one that Lot and, and his daughters lived in. So he found uh, archeological evidence that the cave was actually inhabited um, in that time period. Then he also is the one that found the city, the Byzantine city um, of Zoar and uh, excavated it, but he's only excavated the top few layers, the Islamic and the Byzantine layers. He's found okay. the uh, early bronze pottery there and middle mm. bronze and, and a whole bunch of different uh, age pottery, but, um, but he hasn't gotten down to those layers. So really that's okay. what really needs to happen is get down to the city because the pottery is there, you know that the city is under there. So to get down and excavate that actual city that survived. And, um, and then, you know, I mean, the, the truth is, is, is uh, you could do excavations at Kanazir, you could do excavations at Fifa, you could do more work at Babadra and Numera, but what they found already, in my opinion, is sufficient. Um, mm. It is, it's, it's pretty, clear and pretty obvious you're just going to find more ash and more uh you know human remains splintered all over the place you know that's what you see at this site is uh and uh you're going to find a lot more of the same it's, it's a lot like pompeii you know you go to pompeii mm -hmm. and that's of course the big place that was all destroyed uh in the volcano blast all at one time and these sites are like that they're like a small version of that where everything came to an end in this sudden destruction. So you can dig and dig and dig and dig, but you're going to find a whole bunch more destruction and ash and okay. everything like that. Now there is, um, yeah, there, there, I'm not saying that 
there shouldn't be more work done if there's the possibility to do more work than certainly there is. But there has been enough done at this point that it's pretty obvious. I mean, again, you're looking for five cities of the plain. You've got five archaeological sites. You would expect four of them to be destroyed and never lived in again and one of them to survive history. What do you have in this area? You have four destroyed cities and one of them that wasn't destroyed that survived history to make it onto the Matabo map and to be mentioned by Eusebius and and on and on. And so, um, you know, but the, the main evidence is 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 known. Lines up. OK, yeah. so d- let's go back to one of the, the secular challenges to this, which I think is a very fair question. How do we know some of the people who maybe survived in Zoar were aware of this natural disaster? Spread the word. Years later, these people write this Genesis account with a basic awareness of what took place. As if it's historical, we would expect to find the same archaeological account as what we might find if the Genesis story is true. So part of my question is, what do these remains actually show and prove given that other stories could be told that account for these remains as well. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, what I would say to that is when, when you read the Bible, for people who read their Bibles and know their Bibles, this is, this is, a, this is a phenomenon and a destruction that stands out from the biblical text. And, okay. um, and that, that is... Um, is on a grand scale and it, and we're given a lot of detail about it. Um, we're, we're given where these cities are located. We're given, um, at least generally where they're located. Um, we're given, uh, specifics details about how they're destroyed. And, um, and so we have this all preserved in the biblical texts, which are ancient texts. And um, and then we have these uh, cities that um, that date to the time period that the Bible is talking about and that are destroyed in the way that the Bible is talking, talking about that are never inhabited again, even Mm -hmm. though they have fresh water going by them, even though to this day, this is an incredibly important agricultural area. These cities were never rebuilt. And so, um, and so, and then we don't have, if, if, if those scholars that are saying, oh, well, this is, this is a, another story that happened. We, well, you don't, that's not based on an ancient text because we don't have ancient texts that gotcha. are telling another story that happened in this area at a different time or something like that. Oh, now we found this, mm-hmm. now we found this account that says that this other thing happened in this area. And that must be what the, um, what the Bible was copying or something we don't have any texts that say that we don't have any other story preserved account Mm. preserved in history we have one ancient account that talks about sodom and gomorrah otherwise if it wasn't for that one nobody would even know but they would know nobody would care nobody would Mm. care about these piles of rocks and these uh, layers of ash and nobody would even look at it nobody would have gone looking for it in the first place um and so uh and so I would say to uh, to that kind of interpretation, okay, um, show me the show me the written account that you're talking about, because that's really what it comes down to with many of these things that are the arguments against the mm-hmm. Bible. We're in the strong position. Why? Because we have an ancient text, a series of ancient texts that talk about all these things that that match with the archaeological evidence coming up from the ground. These theories that tried to dethrone the Bible and the evidence are not based on any ancient account. They're merely uh, based on modern opinion of, well, it could have happened this way or it could have happened that way. Um, So I say the stronger position is the one that connects to a Hmm. written source. And that's that's why carbon-14 is not a strong position. Gotcha. That's uh, That's why these archaeological sites and their destructions and pottery and stuff like that are a strong position because they do connect to a, a written account from the ancient past. That's a real helpful way to look at it. If we had one text that said, yeah, here's another account for this and it, trying to explain it away or some positive reason that the Israelites invented this account, then it'd be hard to adjudicate between the sources. But we have one source 
that claims to be historical, written in historical fashion, we find what we would expect, the lack of another source. It seems the burden of proof is on the person who says, no, they totally invented it, and here's what happened when there's a lack of evidence for that other story. I think, so it doesn't, it's not the nail in the coffin because we're dealing with events 4,000 years ago, but I would certainly consider this strong, if not very strong, corroborative support for the biblical account and amazing of this, we're talking 4,000 years ago, chapter 18 and 19 in Genesis doesn't get much earlier than that. Now, I want people to go watch your video. It's only 15 minutes in length and you are on site. So if they say, you know, a picture is like a thousand words or whatever that metaphor is, that 15 minutes of you driving up and pulling these sulfur balls out, it's so interesting. If you have stayed with us till the end of this, you've got to go click over, uh, watch this for 15 minutes, and then also subscribe to Joel's new YouTube channel. Last question, tell us about that YouTube channel and what you expect to do on it uh, for the time to come. Yeah, it's pretty brand new. Uh, it's it's uh, been up for 10 weeks, and so we've uh, released 10 videos on it so far. It's called Expedition Bible, and uh, and that's uh, what I'm hoping to do is, is just keep presenting um, evidence for the Bible in uh, videos that people can um, digest, hopefully, and and watch through. So it's quite a diversity of topics, mm. and it's it's uh you know it takes advantage of of uh, the benefit of living here and being able to go to yeah. places that I'm talking about, and not just not just in Israel and Jordan, but also in Egypt and Iraq and Lebanon and and on and on. So yeah, Sudan. Amazing. I want to tell everybody who stayed with us, go to Expedition Bible, hit subscribe. Now we'll have you on regularly to talk about these finds because the videos are a little shorter. You get right to the point. You tell a story. It's a journey. And then maybe we'll have you on now and then, and we will go into some more depth and unpack these so people really understand the background and scholarly issues behind it. But Joel, you're always a rock star. Fun to have you on. Appreciate your enthusiasm. And just for living there, 28 years and doing this on-hand research is super cool. Thanks for coming back. Hey, thank you.